Hello everyone and welcome to part three on linear control. Right, so we've come a long way actually. Um, what we started with was this upper two rows, uh, this control problem where we want to find x, small x, which means the state of dimension lowercase n at n different capital N different time steps and the associated control input. Right, so we had this task, the sum goes from here to here, minimize over x, k, q, x, plus u, r, u, so quadratic term in x, quadratic term in u, and then this terminal cost on the state. Subject two, and now here's the special case, a linear dynamical system. And we took quite a bit of effort to transform this into a form that looks like this, where we had minimized only over u, which is now capital U, which is just a, a flattened or vectorized version of this matrix. So m times capital N minus one dimensional, and the objective function was just a quadratic form in terms of u and a parametric dependency on the initial condition, right? So we encoded the entire dynamics in this large, very large uh, matrix matrix multiplication uh, where we saw that actually what you need to do is um, to multiply the dynamics, the, the a raised to certain powers times b with u plus a raised to certain powers times the initial condition. And so everything was encoded here, was, was transferred directly into the objective function, and we found this solution where we could simply solve a linear system to obtain the optimal control. And so what we're going to do now is just study a very simple example to see how this actually looks, all right? So let's consider, as I said, it's going to be a very simple example, let's consider a robot moving in the plane. And this can be an example, for instance, if you think about logistics, you know, a forklift trying to move on a shop floor to transport packages uh, or something like this. So we have a system that has four states. So usually it's continuous time because we know, model this from, from mechanical properties. Um, so at a given point in time, our state X is composed of the position, which I'm going to denote by P, in the first direction, uh, the velocity in the first direction, or the, the horizontal direction, and then the same for the vertical direction, so P2 and V2. Okay, so it's a four-dimensional state, um, and we are going to assume very, very simple dynamics. So we have seen this in modeling the damped harmonic oscillator, for instance, the change of position is simply the velocity. So p dot in the jth coordinate of t is simply vj of t. Right? So we would see both coordinates are actually decoupled. And the law for the velocity is given by by the acceleration. This is something we can do ourselves. This will be the control input, as well as a friction term, just as we did in the damped oscillator. Okay, so what we're going to consider is a dampening term, which is d, so the dampening constant, or friction coefficient, if you wish, divided by the mass times the velocity, and then plus a control input uj of t, right? And this is for j equals one or two. So we have this for both coordinates, very simple dynamics, you know, change in position is the velocity, change in velocity is a friction coefficient, you know, because we lose, where we have a force opposing the direction in which we move, plus we have an acceleration that we can pick ourselves. So what we get uh, in sum is this ordinary differential equation, x of t is given by this matrix, 0, 1, 0, 0, times x. So the change in position 1 is the velocity 1. And now we have here <coughs> the friction term, d over m. This is the change in velocity. And we have the same thing for our second component. And what's missing, obviously, is the control term, right? So what we have is plus 
zero zero one zero 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 one. So the velocity in the first direction is changed by the first control. And the velocity change in the second direction is influenced by the second control. So a very simple dynamical system and it's in continuous time so we're not quite there yet. What we simply need to do is we need to fix u of t over time intervals of length delta t. So we introduce a time discretization by this delta t and we're going to say we assume we fix the input over these time instances. And this will allow us, well, we're not going to go into details, but we had this in the dynamical system section of this course. What you can do if you introduce this, what we call a zero order hold, um, we can simply use laws, you know, matrix exponential and so on, to derive a discrete time version of the system given these time steps. So what we will get is x a plus one is a matrix A xk plus B uk. Right? And to be clear, this matrix is obviously not A, right? So this is something that you might call a tilde, for instance. So a continuous time matrix, same here, B tilde. And then you can use these matrices to compute the discrete time analogs to this. Okay? And so our task is going to be now to steer our robot to the origin. Right, and now let's have a look at some code to see what actually happens. So here is the implementation of what I have written here um, and we are going to compare these two formulations in terms of the dynamics and then we're going to solve the linear system to, to obtain the optimal input. Okay, so what you see is here, here I've given it the, the AC is the A continuous, this was my A tilde here, and the BC, the B continuous is the B matrix you see here. Okay, now I have basically more or less randomly assigned a damping coefficient, which is 10, and the mass m is 1000, a ton for, for my, let's say, small forklift or whatever we're studying here. And so what you see is these are the matrices, and we are going to introduce a delta t of 0 0.1. This is my time discretization, and then I have small n is 4, small m is 2, so state dimension is 4, input dimension is 2, and what you see here is, uh, the details don't matter, you can look at the code uh, later if you're interested, is this is how we compute the discrete time A version and the discrete time B version. Uh, this is the numerical integration or an approximation of, of a numerical integral. So the details don't really matter. What we have now is A and B in the setting that we have introduced here. So we're basically exactly in this control task, right? Um, what we need to do is define Q and R, but we will get there. Before we do so, let's just study the dynamics a little bit, okay? So what we consider in the next uh, setting here is our initial condition. So we start at position 2 and 0 with an initial velocity of 1 and 1. So we are right to the origin, if you wish, and far we are moving to the top and to the right with velocity 1 and 1, respectively. So considering 50 time steps will give us um, a 5 second time interval. And now what we can do is I'm just, you know, introducing random control, just a linear change in the control over time to see how the dynamics look. And so what you see here, this is a simple, you know, integrator, a times xk plus b times uk gives me xk plus one. And what happens if I simulate this is exactly this. So you see in the bottom row, the input that I'm using, I said, this is just randomly a, a linear change from minus one to, to plus one, or from zero to minus one. And you see here, these are the four states. Blue and orange mean the two positions, and green and this pink mean the velocities. And so because this is not well, very easily visible, let's say, or understandable, this is a trajectory in our position space. So we start at 2, 0, moving top right, as we said, right? And then the control will lead us to this small period, period and then we stop, or the, the time ends, let's say. All right. 
And so what we can do now is we can do the state transition or the reformulation, okay? So what you see here is there's some text again, but this is exactly what we have derived in the previous video. So our big X is this concatenation of these uh, states X from time zero to Xn. And what we get is this huge matrix G times U plus H times X zero, just as you see it here. And you see this is exactly how we defined or developed this recursive law. So what we get is X is G times U plus H times X zero. And what we need to do is we just need to write a little for loop to assemble these G and H matrices. So what you will see is, you know, we get the G and H in, in the appropriate dimensions and then just insert in the right places A raised to certain powers times V and in the H matrix just A raised to certain powers. Okay. And so all we need to do now is we can assemble G and H, do a reshape command, right, our matrix M inputs times N time steps. So this would be uh, two by 50 is reshaped into 100 dimensional vector. And the state prediction is now just G times U plus H times the initial condition. And all I'm doing here is I'm comparing the little X and the big X. So little X is what we have done before. You see our nice little period, period, period that we're drawing here. And the big X just shows you obviously it's equivalent. So we just, this is a sanity check if you wish that the, 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 the reformulated dynamic system gives us the same result. And what we can do now is we can define the control problem, right? So here is the original formulation exactly as you see it here, the top two rows. And we have seen also that we can do this reshaping by introducing Q hat, which is all these Q matrices, this block diagonal matrix and the Q final. And the same for the R matrix, which is our R hat. And this is exactly as we derived it in the, in the last video where you see that we get this quadratic form. Here's a quadratic term in U, a linear term in U, and this constant term. So if we take the derivative of this, we got this um, equation. And if we set it to zero, we saw that we found this linear system. So U star means the optimal solution solves this linear system. So all that we need to do now is really to assemble Q hat and R hat, you know, which is just we put Q on the diagonal and we put R on the diagonal and here the Q hat, the last one is the Q final. And so now we can define Q and Q final and R, where you see for Q, we're just going to penalize the positions. So we penalize the first position by one, the second by one, and the final one is 10 times this. So in the end, we want to really make sure that we at the origin in the end. And we have a small penalty on the control input, which is 10 to the minus two, so a little smaller to give us a small input penalty, but, but not too large, really. What matters is the, the position in the end. And so now we assemble Q hat and R hat, and finding the optimal U is just solving this linear system. So this is exactly what we have derived. The right-hand side backslash operator is just, you know, give me the solution of this is our matrix, and this is the right-hand side vector, which is now parametric dependent on the initial condition. And so what you get is, just the X opt by solving the system, right? We have no solve for U, we can simulate the system and this is just a reshape command to get back the original sizes. And so this is what we get, right? And so you see that this looks actually very convincing. The first one is again, the two positions and the two velocities. This one is we started in two zero and you see this is the trajectory we go until we at the origin here. And this is the control input that we actually need for this. So you see, by solving a linear system, we have actually computed the optimal input to steer right into the origin. And you might say, well, we take this detour here. This is because we're penalizing the control input. If we had changed the penalty on the U, so the R matrix, then we might as well take the closest uh, move directly to the origin, but then the control input would go to much, much higher values than just minus 20 here. All right. This concludes our mini-series on, on linear control. I hope you found that this is really actually very useful. And what's left to be discussed is the special case of nonlinear systems. We also need to look a little bit at feedback control, so real-time control. And then there's the question, how does data come into the picture, right? And you can guess it. We have learned quite a bit about how to approximate linear systems from data. So if you don't know anything about the dynamics, we can still always try to learn a system like this.
and then solve control problems on data-driven models. But this is going to be topics of the, the, the next videos to come. Thanks for now and see you soon.